Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to the Secret Resume Podcast, hosted by me, Melody Moore. In this podcast, we explore the people, places, and experiences that have shaped my guests, those which have influenced who they are as people and where they are in their work life today. You can listen in as we have a rich exploration of often unexamined and undiscussed, but very important aspects of their lives, or as I like to call it, their secret resume. My guest today is Maddie Shine. Maddie is a visibility coach for women in business. She has helped thousands of female entrepreneurs with her trainings, courses and My Visible Vibes online community. She firmly believes that life is literally full of opportunity and it's up to us to find and get booked by those who want to work with us. Specialising in the creative industries, She has been featured on many industry stages, podcasts and events in the UK and around the world. Based in London, Maddie is easily spotted by her bright blue hair and large and colourful earrings. A fun fact about Maddie is that Sandy Toxvig once called her a clever girl, a fact she cherishes daily. Uh, Maddie Shine, really, really happy to have you here with your beautiful coloured wall behind you, which matches your hair, as I just uh, just pointed out. But Maddie, do you want to say a little bit about who you are um, and then we can really get into your very interesting uh, story? Well, thank you so much. It's so wonderful to be here. Thank you. Um, I love having a good chat. So this, this, will, be a great, this will be a great session. Um, so, yes, so I'm Maddie Shine. Sadly, that was not my birth name, but it's certainly the name that I'm most well known by. Um, I am a visibility coach for women in business. That is how I frame myself these days. I teach courses, I run workshops, um, usually online, but also in real life now that we're this side of you know what. And I absolutely love showing women how to take up space on the internet with their businesses. So they're usually solo women in business and they usually make things, create them, offer them as services. So I work with all sorts of amazing, creative, talented people all over the UK um, and also sometimes in Europe and Australia and America. And uh, I have been in business now coming up to 11 years, uh, which is wild. If anyone had asked me what I'd been doing with my life, this is definitely not how I saw it come, saw it happening. But I am so thrilled, actually, that, um, that it's all working you know, pretty well. And uh, I'm based in South East London in a lovely park called Crystal Palace. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking how um, Maddie Shine is such a perfect name for a visibility coach. It's it's nominative determinism, even though it wasn't your name, you said. Um, (laughs) It feels like um, it's, it's a perfect name for what it is that you do. You're helping women to shine. So, yeah. Yeah. Great name. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> All ties in well, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. it's, almost, it's almost like you chose the name. Oh, it unlike is. myself being called Melody, and I'm the least melodic, least musical person you could meet and definitely cannot sing to save my life. Well, I can, but very, very badly. Um, so, yes, I don't live up to uh, up to my name at all, which is quite sad. But there we go. So, Maddy, let's go right back. Let's go back to the 90s. I feel like a Radio 2 DJ saying that. <laughs> let's go back to the 90s. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, when you were at school, um, do you want to talk a little bit about you did something that was probably quite unusual and certainly quite unusual for a girl at that time? So, yes, yeah, so I am now 40. Um, so in the 90s, that was my teen years. So very formative for me. And I went to a private convent school, uh, mainly because I did not get into the grammar school. I didn't get high enough 11 plus, And I tried not to let that affect me. But of course it did. Like these things always stick with you, right? Um, but I actually went to my mum's old school. So I knew some of the nuns there. And I knew that I'd be well taken care of there. And whilst many of my friends now will kind of say I did not have a good time at that school, I loved it. I had a great time. 
because what I did was I really leaned into the role of teacher's pet. And so I was a real SWAT. I just basically SWAT. God, I haven't said that word in a long time, but I was. <laughs> um, but I, I, you know, I just basically I absolutely loved learning. I loved um, all these kind of different topics that, you know, I'd never heard of before. And basically, um, I really wasn't popular. I didn't have many friends. So what I did was I spent a lot of time with doing things that I did love. Um, and one of those was being with computers, basically. I just learned how to use computers really early on. My dad always used to bring back computers from work. He was a GP. And uh, essentially, we I just basically used to watch him code. I used to watch him do all these kinds of like fantastical things and then different things would happen and I had no idea what any of it meant but I just thought that looks pretty cool and so you know when he got the internet I think this was 97 it was before any of my friends had the internet and so I thought well, what, what what is this thing it's connecting with me with people all over the world that's incredible um what amazing opportunities there must be out there to to meet people who have a you know these kind of interests and all this you know all sorts of other people that I could be friends with you know <laughs> basically like a lonely teenager you know <laughs> the usual the usual teenage angst and then some um, and so I actually learned to code uh, my dad gave me a subdomain of his business website which would never happen now can you imagine uh, but yeah so he gave me a page and I basically designed this website being sixteen it was about Ace Ventura Bagpuss and I think the Magic Roundabout. Um, <laughs> Oh, and, that's a and very I, strange mix <laughs> you know yes it was all like I just thought it was cool and retro and I used all these this massive candy font and I just thought it was amazing and they and I was like oh yeah I'm gonna learn how to design my own fonts and I learned how to code in html and I just thought the whole thing was brilliant I just I just loved it and um and obviously I sort of kept it a bit secret but my dad was highly encouraging he was like oh this is great if you want to do this you know but that wasn't really like I remember doing careers tests at school and people were saying, you know, the test were coming out. Well, you're a real people person. You know, you should look at social work or, you know, with a personality like yours, maybe a stage manager. And I was thinking, who puts me backstage? I mean, no, you know, I, <laughs> I, love, I did drama DCSE. I loved it. You know, I was I was in all the school plays and everything. Um, and so I just I had no idea what I was going to do. But I did know that I really liked this, you know, working with computers. But that just didn't seem to be an option unless you wanted to go full nerd, you know, mm -hmm. and I definitely didn't want to do that. So why not? Went, what what was why not full nerd? Because I really liked the arts. I liked art and I liked drama and I liked English and I liked books. And so I was that kind of, you know, theatre nerd, if you liked. I, I went to the theatre a lot with my family. I, I grew up in Devon and we used to come to London an awful lot. Um, because my parents used to go to university here so they had lots of friends and we had family here and it was yeah London was always the place that I knew I was going to end up so I think that's maybe why the bullying and stuff didn't matter quite so much sometimes at school because I knew that I wasn't going to be there forever and I knew that I was going to go on to London and that I didn't know what I was going to do but I, I was very you know I was sort of like no I, I you know this isn't you know, I'm, I'm, my mum my used to say to me, well, you know, bully for them. And I was like, well, it's all very well for you to say, mum, you know, you're not, you're not the teenager going through it. But actually, mum and dad did help gain, you know, help me keep perspective in all of that because they were like, let's encourage her skill. Let's encourage her to dream bigger. And I was like, oh, actually, <laughs> looking back, I was like, wow, that <laughs> really was quite good, actually, for them to do that. Because, as you know, not every not every parent is like that, I guess. no. Um, but you had that you could cope with the with the difficult time and the bullying because you knew yeah. you weren't going to stick around maybe maybe looking back with hindsight certainly didn't feel like that at the time but I think with adult perspective and therapy maybe that's what I was going through um but I um no so I actually changed schools for sick form and had a terrible time had even worse a time re really bad um but I did really cool A-levels um things that weren't available at the convent school so I did media studies so I got to study film I thought that was the coolest thing the teachers were horrible but you know it was the coolest topic uh I studied Christian theology having gone to a convent school I wasn't allowed to question anything and I was deeply fascinated by that um I just thought you know let's talk about abortion and euthanasia and 
all these things. And so I learned to question ideas, although I didn't do very well in my A-level for that because you were supposed to write all the kind of people who agreed it and the people who didn't agree with it and then conclude with who you agreed with. And then I just used to make up my own opinion to conclude and they didn't like that. So they didn't give me a very good score. <laughs> <laughs> Two out there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I didn't think I was particularly radical, to be honest. I was sort of like, no, I'm just trying to play it. I play a slightly under the radar but again I was doing a lot of um, theatre I was involved in plays at school and I used to go away to Stratford-on-Avon on trips and things like that um, and I started doing work experience so you were encouraged in this work experience scheme through school to apply for a week somewhere and most people in Devon sort of went to you know a local business basically I decided that I wanted to go further afield and my dad through his connections because he's a he's also a rowing journalist I went and got a week experience at the, um, at the uh, boat race press office. So do let me just get this right. Your dad was a GP and a rowing journalist. Oh, I mean, my dad is a massive portfolio career guy. Like he he's never going to retire. He's He travels all over the world commentating on rowing these days. Like it's amazing. So I think that's probably also why I'm just like, oh, yeah, I do this now. And I do this now. And haven't you heard I do this, you know? So it's just it's sort of I grew up with that and uh, and knowing that I would just be a very busy person, no matter what I was doing, you know. Um, so, yes. Yeah, so I, I went and did a week's work experience and it was eye opening being in London. So I stayed with my cousins and I never really traveled on the tube on my own before. I was 17 and it was so exciting. I absolutely loved it. And actually, then they asked me, someone in that office then asked me to come and do Basically, I was a runner, you know, office runner. And then I was asked for a paid week the following year at London Marathon Press Office. And it was so much fun. I got to stay in a hotel on my own that time. My God, it was so exciting. <laughs> Over at Tower Bridge, and I was like, wow. And I had a boyfriend by that time. And they gave me this brick of a mobile phone. And I ran up some horrendous bill. They didn't tell me till afterwards. I felt a bit bad about that. Um, but, uh, I mean, it was the year 2000, you know, like it was... Um, it, it was a different time, should we say. And I couldn't believe about all these different business, different careers that all these different people had that I met. So in the press office, there were all these women in PR and they were all early to mid 30s, which I thought at the time was frightfully old. I thought, my God, they're like proper grown ups. They all know what they're doing. And, you know, they've really got their shit together. Excuse me if I don't know if I can swear. Um, fine. And, <laughs> and, and, and I'm now much older than them. I'm now, well, much older. I'm 40 now. And I'm sort of thinking, my God, like, how, how did I put these women on such pedestals? But they, you know, they got, they introduced me to Margaritas and they took me to see Bridget Jones' Diary and, which I thought was a radical movie. I'd never seen such a thing. And I just was like, wow, is that what it's like? And they were like, yeah, great, isn't it? Drinking Chardonnay on your own in your own flat. And I was like, God, I can't wait to move to London if that's what it's going to be like. Wow. Um, but yeah, it was really, they, they gave me some really, really great advice. I was about to go and study teaching at university because I thought I love, I loved school, love English. Why not go and become an English teacher? So I was going through the UCAS process for that. And actually, they said, listen, Maddie, I think that you are putting yourself in too small a box. I think that you, if you don't know what you want to do, then you need to open up and be broader. So do something like maybe just English rather than English teaching. Or, you know, I said, I think I'm going to do business. So I studied business at UWE in Bristol um, after a gap year. And honestly, that gap year was also so needed for me because I just needed to take a break. Like I said, mm. sick form was quite tough. And after all that advice and everything, and I'd been doing even more careers tests, I didn't know what to do. So I took a gap here and I went to secretary school in my local town. But I like, because I've been learning all these computer stuff, I was like, I might as well get the certificate for it. And so actually there were all these mums going back to work after, ki after having kids. So I basically became the teaching assistant. And I loved it. I thought it was great. I, I, I again met all these people that I would never normally have met um, from all sorts of walks of life. And they were just like, who are you? This like chirpy kind of 19 year old. Like I was just like happy to help and, you know, really going for teacher's pet thing again. <laughs> and uh, yeah. And then I went to, yeah, like I said, I went to study business in Bristol. And it's quite a leap, isn't it, from studying 
teaching English or uh, becoming an English teacher to business studies, they're quite different. Where did that idea for business studies come from? Do you remember? No, no idea. No idea. I think it was probably suggested by one of those PR ladies. Mm. I just, I, they were just like, just do something really broad, like journalism, marketing, business, because then you can always apply it to anything. And mm. I think that's probably why I went into those secretary school certificates as well, because then I would always have a backup plan. Mm. I, I love going out. I love going to bars, but I knew I, wouldn't, I wasn't a very good waitress or barmaid or anything like that, because I tried doing that when I was a teenager. I was appalling. Uh, I got talking to too much to people, basically. <laughs> too distracted. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. I now know it's because I have a neuro spicy brain, but I didn't know that at the time. Um, so, so yeah, so basically I thought if I go and do secondary certificates, I can go and temp uh, in the time when I haven't got lectures. And that's what I did. That's what I did for, for beer money when, when, throughout university. And it was hugely helpful um, because actually that's where my first taste of entrepreneurial stuff came in. Um, so what I did was I found out that the agency were charging something like £35 an hour for me, and I was getting £7.50 an hour, um, which back then still felt quite high because mm. my friends, I think, were getting £5. You know, like it was just that kind of time. And so I uh, said, I'd I got quite friendly with one of the lawyers that I was temping for, and I said to him, um, so I've just found out about this discrepancy, and uh, I was wondering what you thought about sacking the agency and uh and hiring me because then you always get the guaranteed me you don't like you don't play roulette with whatever temp you might get they had a big fur with lots of different lawyers always needing pas and secretaries and i said you just pay me 15 pounds an hour instead and they said how about 12 i said done there we go and that was and that was that basically and it was great it really like i said it it was it was my first taste of oh if I ask for something, there's a chance that people might say yes. Mm. It was quite an exciting opportunity. I love that. I love the idea of cutting you there, cutting out the middleman. <laughs> I mean, quite bold, really. Quite bold, yeah. yeah. I was going to say the, that. The agency called me up and they were like, oh, you know, this is this is illegal, blah, blah. And I was like, well, I think you better speak to the lawyers. You know, I sort of played dumb about it. And the lawyers were like, we're lawyers. What are you going to do? You know, like it was just... <laughs> Perfect. So let's take a, a bit of a leap forward from that time then um, and talk about, uh, you know, a, a sort of uh, event in your life that really feels like everything else just has happened off the back of that in terms of that uh, you were made redundant during the 2009-10 financial crisis. Yes. Yes, I was. I was. So... So I, I had gone and I'd done my business degree. I'd done various different jobs in London and I was working in a job in Wandsworth, Southwest London. I was a marketing manager. So I worked for this catalogue company. You know, there's catalogues that's mm. all out of newspapers, selling things that you never knew you needed, you know, all of that Magnifying stuff. glasses. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And maps for jigsaws, all that stuff. Um, so yeah, so loved it. Absolutely loved the team. We had a, looking back, pretty much codependent situation going on but it was a really small team everyone got on really well we all went out drinking together all the time it was everything I as a 25 year old could possibly want you know this is your Bridget Jones years yes exactly oh my goodness yes I hadn't even typed that in a while <laughs> I was just like yeah this is great loving life um I lived with my best friend um and she works and still does work in film and tv and we were just yeah we were just living our best life we i was organizing fancy dress parties all sorts of things and then i got made redundant and we'd sort of known that things were not looking great our um founder if you like had suddenly dropped dead uh one august bank holiday when he was out running and it really shook the company and particularly because we were a small company Obviously, there were changes to be made, but it was, it was, it was pretty horrible that whole situation. And I had just met a guy who I would then later marry and then divorce. Like it was just, it was like this really pivotal time. And he had gone to India for the winter. He was always that. It was that was always his plan before I met him. And so I thought, you know what? I'm going to do the same. When I got my redundancy check. I was like, I'm going to go to India. And he said, oh, thank God for that, because I'm going to go back. So we went together. And 
it was this whole adventure. I never, I never went traveling my gap year when all my friends did. I was such a home girl, really. And I'd never really, you know, gone on holiday without my parents, to be honest, let alone, I mean, maybe a couple of trips here and there, but never anything like India. And also the other thing was that my grandpa had fought in India and he was incredibly emotional about telling me about what it was like and would tell me all these stories and this far off place. And it looked magical. And it was, it was amazing. Like I just couldn't believe how much I loved it. So I was there for six months and then basically that started like a nomadic existence. So I would live in London on a houseboat for six months in the summer. And then I would go back to India for six months in the winter and I did that for a few years and um it was quite an exciting sort of chapter because I really thought that when I was made redundant I thought no one's going to hire me because you know financial crisis no one was hiring um you know I'm going to have to go back to going I'm going to have to go back to temping which I did and that was absolutely fine because actually then I got in with a team at a bank over in the city and they paid me more than I'd ever been paid I think double what I was being paid as a marketing manager just because of the type of company it was. And uh, it was great. So I always had that to fall back on. But of course, it wasn't fulfilling. So I knew that I had to look for something more. So were you working in India? Or were you just traveling and working here to pay? For India? Yeah, that was that's what it was. Yeah, that's what it was like the first few winters. And then um, I thought, Oh, gosh, this isn't sustainable. Or I need to be sustainable in a different sort of way, because this is not challenging to my brain being secretary at that kind of temp level um and so I didn't really know what to do and so you know of course sensible advice was coming to me going you should take a full-time job in the city particularly because it pays well you know build up a nice nest egg all this stuff and I was like no don't want to do any of that thanks very much I was in India I was very involved in a meditation school and I used to volunteer out there and go which was beautiful and I was involved for 10 years in total. So it was really kind of like, no, that's what I want to do. And how am I going to use my strengths and talents to the best of my ability and really have a fulfilling life? That's what I wanted. So I started my own business. But it didn't really look like that at the beginning. So this was 2012. I had just got married and I was just leaving London. And I started writing for a wedding blog. So basically an online wedding magazine. So when you got married, you went to India then. So 2012. Yeah. Yeah. And then I got my first client through that. And she paid me £10 an hour. And I was so happy earning that £10 an hour. I cannot tell you. I was just writing blog posts for her. I was running her social media. I just thought it was brilliant. And um, so I did 10 hours a month for her. I was like, yeah, this is brilliant. And then actually, sort of working up to that, I, I tried various different side hustles. It wasn't like I just landed on that one and that one worked. Mm. I had run a proofreading business for a while helping I'd run helping people with their CVs for a while I'd run a transcription business for a while I was I, I was going great guns but actually it was it wasn't like it wasn't using my creative brain mm -hmm. you know the, all the art stuff that I loved from school so uh, so yeah so it was it was great to finally land on this thing because then she then started telling me people about me it was great so I then started supporting people with their SEO with getting found on Google um, with their websites, with all the, it was tying in the tech stuff that I've been doing all these years. It was tying in all the creative stuff that I'd always longed to be doing and writing. It was tying in teaching people, which I'd always wanted to do. Um, that's why I was going to go and become an English teacher. So it was, it really started to tie things together, uh, which was amazing. That's really interesting, isn't it? So there was the, the teaching, which you were going to do and then didn't the English, which you loved, the tech stuff that you started learning when you were 16, and I guess then went and did those secretarial qualifications as well, probably related to that. Just out of interest, that that tech stuff and the coding, which started uh, when you were young, did you carry on with some of that more techy side of things throughout those yes, years? Yes, absolutely. So I went, to, I went to do an open university certificate in web app development. Uh, web development and I'd also tried and tried various different app ideas um I met various people along the way who had encouraged me and helped me I'd run um kind of secret blogs to start writing more 
I'd even try to start writing books and things like that. So I'd always try to tie in those different interests, kind of like an underlying thing, because I thought that would be a really cool way to get, yeah, way, way to keep my interest going, even as a side hustle in addition to my day job. Mm -hmm. Sounds like you were doing side hustles before the phrase side hustle was invented. Definitely, definitely, yes. In fact, when, the, when that phrase suddenly became a thing, I was like, aren't, you're just talking about life, aren't you? But again, now knowing that I'm neurospicy, <laughs> like, no, that's just, a, that's just how my brain works, kind of how it has to be kind of occupied with all my different interests, yeah. <laughs> and so is that, you've said a, a couple of times about your neurospicy brain, is that yeah. that you, you know, is it that you need constant stimulation is that where you think all of these ideas and these different uh yeah. side hustles comes from yeah absolutely because so in, in the past couple of years I've been doing so much reading about ADHD and neurodivergent people and I'm just no I, I I've never felt more like seen as the kids say you know just like it's just wow this is literally how my brain is and I thought everyone's brain was like that and I've met so many people who do who have been diagnosed now with ADHD um who they're just like yeah I also thought that everybody just thought like this and it turns out no our brains are just different and that's great and and it feels it feels really good to sort of just be I feel more grounded and much more stable knowing that that is how my brain works because if I am in constant need of stimulation I also need that, that I also know that that's a sign I need rest if mm. that makes sense um and so because otherwise I know I'm going to spin out and head to burnout you mm -hmm. know which has happened in the past to me for sure because of all my different interests and and desire for stimulation basically mm. Mm. so you eventually settled on or, or did you settle on um you know that business idea or was it just that that one, one particularly took off what what made you really focus on the SEO area well, it's basically because there was no one in my field who was doing it the way I wanted it to be done. So um, to all these small businesses, they were just like, there's all this boring advice out there. And I was like, well, I understand it. And I can just translate it into actual motivational, inspirational marketing advice. And they were just like, yes, we will pay you for that. That's essentially how it happened. And then I became known as this SEO expert in my industry. So I was you know, the go-to person in the wedding industry in the UK uh, for a good while. Um, and I was kind of running audits and website projects and copywriting. And I was trying to run this kind of full stack agency, but it just wasn't profitable. I, I built up too quickly and I had all these contractors and it was just, it was exhausting and I hit burnout essentially. So I then made the switch to teaching courses. So rather than constantly trying to do it for people, I was, um, yeah, I, I made the switch to to courses and of course then I could reach more people as well because my mission really was to help as many people who wanted my help as possible and that is still my mission really um it's just that I've just been you know molding and evolving over the years to to find the best way to do that that suits me as well uh, as well as well as them yeah yeah it's one thing that I uh, also being self-employed you kind of read a lot around how you are restricted by your personal capacity um and you know the danger for burnout is very real i think oh yes yes a hundred percent percent i have i've been on there's a burnout podcast that i was on i think maybe in lockdown talking about this because i think that it's so it's something that people don't talk about enough because our we have been taught to to produce 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 you must be busy. Busy is glamorous. Busy is fun. If you're not busy, then there must be something wrong with your life. In fact, I was even at an event last week and another speaker said to me, because he had no idea who I was and that's fine. You know, it's not like I'm that famous. I'm not Katy Perry. I know that. But it was funny because he said, oh, are you busy? And I said, yeah. And he went, well, that's good. It's a sign you're doing something right. And I was like, I can't even begin to tell you what I, I, I didn't know him, so I didn't say it. But I, I wanted to say, I can't begin to tell you how many wrong things there are in what you just said. Mm. Yes. It's yes. just a, it's just a rubbish small talk thing to say, first of all. But also, it's just, no, you know, what? <laughs> like, that's, that's not why I started my business. I don't think anyone starts their business to be busier. <laughs> no. And I think, for me, that's really interesting, having 
Uh, I've worked in a very corporate career for 20 years or so, yeah. working for big organisations and, and always looked at people who were self-employed and in some ways I thought, well, you know, I may be working really, really, really hard, but I know I'm guaranteed a salary and I'm being well paid. And there was always a fear for me that you become self-employed and actually you're working just as hard but for half the money, if that sometimes. And whilst the the ability to have the flexibility and make your own decisions, you know, I'm loving all of that, but it, it is an interesting, there's almost like a, um, a snobbery from people who are self-employed about the employed and vice versa, really, and both look at each other a bit askance, but um, <laughs> yes. there's, there's potential yeah. for burnout in both. Yes, but, definitely. But, um yeah when the book stops really genuinely stops with you i think you have to be much more mindful and conscious about your decisions a hundred percent you know i was saying this to people last week because there's now all sorts of insurances that you can get to help you cover sick pay for example that you don't otherwise get as a self-employed person um and i think that you know particularly when i first started out that didn't exist like people were just like if you get sick and you're self-employed, you need to go back to work. And I'm like, yeah, but I'm sick. So you can't, particularly, like, I'm talking about like, long-term sick, you know. Um, and uh, I just think that there's so much more now available to support self-employed people. Uh, there's so many more schemes, free schemes offered by the government even, and uh, just all sorts of different things that just weren't around. And I just think that that's also one of the good things about now I'm in, this, now I'm in kind of describing myself as a coach, that's one of, you know, there's many bad things said about the coaching industry, but one of the many, many good things is that there are so many more ways to be supported as well, mm -hmm. um, that there just weren't before. And that goes for whether you're self-employed, employed, whatever your circumstances, because if you've got a problem, there's a coach out there who will be able to help you. Basically. Yeah, absolutely. Someone knows <laughs> about it. Oh, that's exactly. Cool. <laughs> yeah. um, so let's talk a little bit about that. So you've You've made a sort of pivot, I would say, yeah. in your business recently, um, yeah. away from the SEO um, yeah. side of things. So I guess, A, why? What what caused that pivot to happen? And B, tell me more about what it, what you're doing and why you love yes. it. Yes. Yes. It's sort of, it's funny, really, because it is a sort of a, it, an evolution, if you like, of my mm. business. And I wanted to make a bigger deal about it because, frankly, if I had to talk about keywords for the rest of my life. Something that people always ask me about with SEO and getting found on Google. Uh, I, the, the very idea kind of depressed me. So I really didn't want to do that. So so essentially I'm sort of, I'm still, I'm still doing it, but I'm just not talking about it now. Because what I've always been most passionate about is, you know, all these, all these people with their businesses, all they really want to do, they don't want to become Google experts. They don't want to become web design experts. They don't want all of this stuff. What they really want is to get those sales and bookings. And that's what, that's what I've always helped people with. So whether it's marketing, whether it's web design, whether it's copywriting, whether it's, you know, auditing, whatever it is for their businesses, I've always, I've always done that. It's just that I became so well known for the SEO stuff. And so really it's sort of like a 10 to 2 Sort of pivoting to 10 past two really mm -hmm. it's not quite it's not even a 20 past two you know like mm. it's, it's not a 18 or whatever I don't know how far to go with this analogy but you know what I mean like it's <laughs> I know just, what you mean yeah you did you did um and so I think that when I'm reframing what I do essentially mm. so that's why I call myself a visibility coach because what's the point in doing all this stuff if it's not going to make you visible and actually, it's helped the people I work with already because they're like, yes, of course, that's why, you know, it helps keep them their eye on the long term goal or maybe the short term goal, depending on what they're doing for it. It's just like, oh, the reason I'm plugging away at Instagram today is because I want to be more visible. If I'm not more visible, who cares how many followers I have? If I'm, you know, if I'm if I'm not getting to page one of Google, um, and, uh, you know, like it's not the end of the world. There are many other ways to get to page one of Google, if that makes sense. Um, so, yeah, so it was, it, it's just really helping the people I work with. Um, but it's also helping my own brain because I do so many different, I offer so many different ways to help people. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and that's really why I wanted to to announce this great pivot, if you like. Um, yeah, kind of at the start of this year. Yeah. <laughs> and how's it going so far? Really well. Yeah, love it. So I have launched a brand new course, Teach What You Know, which is basically where I teach people how to turn what they know into a course or a consultancy package, which is, of course, like the natural step for a lot of people now. Um, And I think that's brilliant. It's just I think there's a lot of bad quality information. Um, And I just think that I really want to work with people who really know their stuff and then can turn that into quality offers. Um, And I also think that, um, you know, that there's also, like I said, there's all sorts of different ways to sell what you do. So I lead a lot more with teaching with like personality, for example, which is exactly how I became known, not by selling my soul, but by sharing what I'm up to, how I do it in the way that I do it, rather than like relying solely on logic, I tap much more into emotion. And so we talk a lot more about that in my membership community with my one-to-one clients. So we'll still talk about keywords and heading ones and web design elements and all that kind of stuff. But we'll also talk much more about what's going on for them. What is their capacity? What's actually stopping them from showing up? Because let's face it, we have not been taught how to show up. We've not been taught how to sell ourselves, sell what we do. We've not been taught how to um, take up space. And so then lots of people have then come in and try to teach that, but in a way that feels brash and uh, um, you know just crude and just weird and if you don't believe me then you're a piece of crap and all you know like it's just these and I'm like I don't want to listen to people like that you know we all know who we're talking about these bro marketers and all these horrendous people that we see with those Instagram ads where they're kind of yelling at people and all this kind of stuff like it's weird it feels to me both quite male a lot of the time yes but also quite yeah. american and and british <laughs> people and the way that we present ourselves is different yeah um and what works in america i worked for an american firm for a long time right. um it doesn't land well here so we always used to have to do a lot of translating um, not just of the literal uh, spellings of things but just the translating of how things would work here was different um, but that's what it feels like maybe you're doing is is coming at it with a slightly more British approach to visibility. <laughs> yes, yes, because also when you think about British visibility, you're like, oh, no, thank you. No, thank you. No, <laughs> no, 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 that's not for me. But thank you all the same. Uh, you know, and I think there is this kind of like there's still this underlying whether you're traditional or not, mm. then you you still have this. Oh, God, you can't show off. Showing off is the worst thing. Showing off. You might as well be locked up in prison with the murderers if you if you were if you deem to show off. Mm-hmm. And it's like, what, what's wrong with showing off? What's wrong with that? If it's your business, mm. what's, what's wrong with talking about your life? And uh, there's this brilliant quote called by um by this author called Mona, uh, forgive my pronunciation, El Sawi. I think that's how you pronounce her name. Um, and it's something like the most subversive thing a woman can do is talk about her life as if it really matters and it's just like I I heard that recently and I was like oh my god what it's not my whatsapp status like I will I will just always talk about I'm just like quote is just amazing right really gives gives me the goosebumps every time I listen to it and I just think that why why don't why aren't we talking about our lives as if they really matter because they do because they do really matter and as part of that our businesses matter why wouldn't you want to come along and buy that my buy my wonderful photography or buy my wonderful art or buy my wonderful, you know, knitwear, whatever it is you're making or selling? Um, and I think that you know, um, there's a lot of there's a lot of people out there looking at you, men, uh, who don't have that. They have the audacity that we have not been offered. I think as women. Mm-hmm. So um, so yeah. So I'm. This is why I'm so passionate about 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 what I do now and how I frame that um I was giving a talk last week at a conference well it wasn't really a conference it was sort of like a retreat if you like um to 50 photographers and I was and the talk was how to stop hiding behind the camera because of course they all do Mm -hmm. they know they they believe that their sense of self-worth comes from the quality of the photographs that they take Mm -hmm. rather than 
the fact that they're the ones taking the photograph. Mm. So uh, I've seen this talk. I've seen this so much mm. in organisations. Uh, oh know, yeah. Not not with uh, entrepreneurs, but with people who are within an organisation. The if I had a pound for every person who said my work should just speak for itself, I'd be very rich. Um, oh yes. Yeah, that's what everybody wants to believe is that that their work is good and people will recognize that and unfortunately that is rarely the case oh yeah for sure for sure yeah so you're focusing particularly on women is that right does that mean you won't have male clients um i just think that there's better people better suited out there to work with men yeah mm -hmm. it's not you know i'm not like a i hate men thing <laughs> I'm going out. I'm going out with quite a nice one at the moment. So no. <laughs> <laughs> they're all right. Some of they're my best right. friends are men. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. That's, I suddenly realised I was going into that. Oh my god! No, no. I um, <laughs> no. It's funny though, isn't it? Because yes, that because of the because of the reasons why I'm passionate about visibility, they lend themselves most definitely towards feminism and women taking up space and showing them how to specifically to do that. Where does that lead you next? What's your dream for your business? Well, what I want to do is I really want to, you know, take up space basically with what I what I'm talking about. And what I mean by that is this. I have been so afraid to make this pivot before the pandemic. And I want to continue to have these conversations where and then see where they lead me because I've always I've always been I've always been led by opportunities throughout my whole career throughout everything it's like by doing what I do and actually sticking to what I love then the next opportunity has come along rather than oh oh god do they want this from me okay I'll go and I'll go and try and do that because that's what I was trying to do sometimes with SEO now during the pandemic it served me very well because I was teaching online SEO courses and it helped loads and loads of people I was I was speaking to a thousand women a week sometimes, like it was just wild. But um, I just think that when I'm looking at the future, it'll be different offerings. It'll be courses and workshops, sure, but it'll be working with people in a different way to look at what's really going on for them and um, and probably do some more. Yeah, I'm going to be doing some lots of more development myself. I'm currently doing this kind of feminist um, business course at the moment. Absolutely loving that. And just, I think that some really great things will happen as a result of that. I know it will, because it's already making me read different things, listen to different people, uh, develop myself in different ways. So, um, so who knows basically how it will really look, but I'm very excited. What is a feminist business course? Well, this particular one is take all the things that you know, that you take as standard as business practice and look at them with a feminist lens. So, for example, are you really are you really um, meeting people where they're at, or are you just hoping that they don't really bring their problems to the call, and hoping that you're not actually going to have to treat them where they're at, and just hoping that what your sense of equality is will apply to everybody? For example, <laughs> yeah. So it really makes you and you you start going oh. Actually, so it's making me think so much. And I have it every Monday morning at the moment. What a way to start a week. What a way to start a week. <laughs> wow. I yeah. think I need to go and have a look at that. <laughs> Shout out to Kerry Jarvis. That's who's teaching the course at the moment. And I'm loving it. That sounds amazing. So we've looked forwards. What about looking back and giving some advice to a younger version of you? Oh my goodness, um, such a precious question. Um, it's funny because actually I've got a five-year-old, well, I've got two lovely nieces, one is five, one is two. And the five-year-old one is literally a mini me. She's sassy and chatty, full of a massive personality, my goodness. And she's just so sociable. And so it's almost like I'm giving this advice to her in a way, as well as kind of a younger Maddie. It's just like, keep going. So many people will tell you, so many people who so many people will try and tell you that you're not worth it. You'll be made to feel like you're not worth it. But there'll be so many people in your life who will believe in you. And you need to lean on them. 
you need to find your own support network and you need to enjoy that their support and not shy away from it that's what i would that's what i would say yeah beautiful beautiful you'll have to play it to this to her in a few years when she's old enough to understand it oh yes <laughs> oh. and strapline tagline for your uh for this episode for your story gosh yes i suppose because like i was saying you know by always staying open to new opportunities by sticking to what i love but also being being open and finding those opportunities i think it's I used to describe SEO as seeking exciting opportunities, but actually that's probably the strap line of my, my whole career. <laughs> it's you. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So thank you so much. I, I always um, write down notes uh, whilst I'm recording these and I always walk away with loads of things to go and look up and people to go and check out and things. So no, I'm definitely inspired by the idea of, feminist business course that's for sure yeah um, that sounds very interesting um but yeah love what you're doing i actually came across you because of your seo work of course <laughs> um but thought she sounds like and she seems like a really interesting woman um who's making an interesting change in her life which is why i was really keen to speak to you so thank you so much for your time oh, um thank you. And yeah thank you very much thanks so much thank you Maddie was such a joy to interview. She's absolutely full of life and her personality and her sense of humour really reflected in that bright blue hair and colourful earrings and the amazing colourful background that she has in her home office. Um, the, there were a couple of things that, that really uh, I wanted to, to share that really stood out to me and one of them is this idea of visibility and how we, you know, how we can use personality and emotion to sell rather than just a logic um, and rational approach and, and how we, particularly as women, have not been taught how to, to sell ourselves and to take up space. And I thought the quote that she gave at the end, the most subversive thing a woman can do is talk about her life as though it really matters. It's just the most amazing quote. I got shivers when she said it. I think it's fabulous. And I'm going to print that out and stick it up on my wall. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Secret Resume. If you did, remember to like, share, comment and subscribe as that helps people like you find people like us. <laughs>